Eugene, I need to ask you a question. Sounds serious. What is it? Go ahead. Would you rather train for and run a road mile, like hard out, full noise road mile, or run 100 miles? Oh, oh, that is, I mean, I'm torn. Give me more information. What if you could do both? <gasps> Have you been at the hand sanitizer again, Matt, in the hospital? Not since New Year's, but besides, I'm talking about the spectacle. It's first of its kind running festival taking place in Nelson between Friday the 13th and Sunday the 15th of December. 2024. Nelson, I mean, it's it's the South Island's hat. It's delicious. It's such a beautiful place and it has some of the best trail running in the hemisphere and it's just like, it's generally beautiful. It is stunning. Fuck too. The spectacle is, it is a spectacle. It's got both road and trail events and a festival vibe from 10k to 100 mile on the trails and a bunch of road events from community miles, 5k's to an elite road mile that the organisers are going to be bringing people who you, who we usually watch on our screens to the streets. The spectacle.co.nz for details and get training. Here we go. Welcome to the DCR 8 Station Podcast number 12. I'm Matt Raymond. And I am Eugene Bingham. Tiana Koto Katoa. No mate. Hockey mate. How have you been, Matt Raymond? I've been good, man. I have been. Uh, I felt very postmodern this weekend. Ooh, um, tell me. Keeping on with our conversation last week with Mr. Anthony Kurt Taylor, I was out for a run on Saturday morning and started from home, ran into the forest to do uh, a Gene Andrews Memorial Loop. Oh, what's that? May he rest in peace. Anzac Road Loop. Right. Or as it's known, also a dad bod. Anywho, running up... Yeah, so the... Things have support. changed in the forest since I've running. I know. Heading up the hill, dark, and I see some lights in front of me going up Longbush. And that whole thing of like, you know, the 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 hound comes out a little bit, eh? Like, regard, I don't know if that happens to you. Like, regardless, if you see headlamp in front of you, you're like, I must chase this headlamp and over, see if I can overtake this headlamp. And just plodding up the hill, plodding up the hill and thought, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But then there's the bit in Longbush where it kind of, it switches back on itself and you can see back across and one of them made the mistake of looking back <gasps> at me. So I, I knew at that point. Yes. They knew I was there. Yes. I knew they were there. You were Courtney, they were Poker Pal. Absolutely. And caught up to them at the top, just past the, so sort of just, you know, top of Longbush, got the, caught up to them. And it was Jamie and Marco, two guys who've been running, again, running for probably four years or so. Both of them have gone on, you know, they, they, they've taken to it like a duck to water. Both of them have done the Tarawera Ultra Trail 100 Mile, a bunch of other stuff. And it was super cool just to run with people who, around the same age but haven't been running for as long and just how you know hearing about stories about how they got into running through lockdown and the 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 way that they got into running and and also about like the ease of access for media mm -hmm. yeah you know i felt like a real old timer i was like well we had to go on you know, we had to go to the library and get books or you'd listen to these things called podcasts and they tell you unbreakable you couldn't get that on YouTube. No. You know, you, it was DVDs handed around. DVDs. <laughs> Bust. I think I had Sean Cooper's copy. Yeah. For a while. Did then I had to give it back. It had to be signed out, right. signed back. Yeah. Signed out, signed. Absolutely. Uh, but it was just, it was fantastic. So here for that. And, and I nearly, Scott Jurek was in my head. I was like, D turn your headlamp off. No, don't turn your headlamp off. No, turn your headlamp off. Because then they'll look back and they won't know, you yeah. know. Madness. Utter, anyway. utter madness. Utter madness. Utter madness. <laughs> we go something like further, faster, there in Christchurch. Rocky is hairy and so is Badger. Jules is nice and Jack is delicious. Go further, faster, now. Go oh, further, faster, there in Christchurch. Rocky is hairy and so is Badger. Jules is nice and Jack is delicious. Go further, faster, now. Ditchitch Radio. <laughs> How are you? Well, speaking of Ant KT... Uh, turned up at Park Run Hobsonville Point on Saturday morning, and there is Ant KT and Simon McLean. Wow. One and two at Kings. Simon is a regular at that particular Park Run, and Ant had come to catch up with a mate and walk with his partner and child. So 
initially I was like, oh, it's going to be interesting, a smackdown at Parkrun to sort it out. But no, it wasn't. And so it was just nice to see them both. And I had a lot of pleasure telling people, see that guy over there a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. He ran 348 kilometres. Like, what? So Simon McLean is the um, Parkrun Pram Punisher, he isn't He is. He is. Yes. Yes, yes. So he and Ant, as Ant said in the interview last week, which if you haven't listened to, you should go and catch up. They collaborated and joined and worked together in unison to to get as far as they did, which was, of course, the New Zealand record. So, yeah, it was good to see them. And, of course, the Blues won. Am I allowed to say that? I mean, we do go around the country, but, you know, I, it was pretty powerful. Uh, another manager at work, we've, we've had a long standing. She's a dear friend. We've had a lot. She's from, she's from the Bay Plenty, and she, she reps the Chiefs pretty hard. She mm. had the temerity to turn up to work the other day in a Chiefs jersey. <sighs> Fight and talk. And I messaged her this morning. I was like, oh, hey, Kim, I, I, I didn't see the rugby last night. Could you tell me how it went? Oh, <laughs> that's low. That's low. Look, as a blues, as a blues fan, twenty-one years. Come mm, on, that's true. That's true. Yeah, so that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Look, our entry giveaway for the spectacle has been given away. Thanks to everyone who entered. The winner uh, announced in our newsletter. And if you want to know anything more about the spectacle, check out thespectacle.co.nz. Thank you very much to them, and good luck to everyone who gets along. Now we have a bit of an announcement. This is exciting news. Yes, a few years of quietness. On the merch front and after basically, you know, some people with a fair bit more business mind than us locking Eugene in a cupboard for two hours and beating it with coat hangers, uh, we have gone and stocked up. So we've got a DCR technical trucker hat for sale. You can see that. Mm. It's on my head. I mean, it's not flash. too technical. I got it on my head first time. So um, <laughs> have a look. <laughs> Buy it on the website. It's going for fifty nine ninety nine. dollars plus postage and packaging, and there's a discount for DCR aid station paid subscribers, and have a look in the newsletter for that code. But I must say, very stoked. Uh, feels great, really light. Uh, have yet to run in it, but am excited to absolutely run yeah, this thing. So because we got it as a as a hat you can run in, can't, couldn't we? But I yeah. mean, you can wear it as a, you know, with your tuxedo if you want. But but it's it's a technical hat, running it. Trash it. Absolutely. We were going to go for the DCR bearskins, but we thought, you know, trucker hat probably much yeah. easier to run in. Yeah. Is that uh, Russian winter hat still on its way? The DCR brand? Yeah. That's still coming. Yeah, the Sherpa. I'd love yeah. that. Right. I would legitimately <laughs> <Yeah>. love that. <laughs> we, we sent that money to Putin. Anyway, look, we should get on with our chat with Andrew McDowell. He's our mate, of course. Uh, he's a sound genius as well. He's a pretty damn good runner. And he's finally, finally gotten to run the Western States Endurance Run. When he first entered the lottery, and we had to do a bit of research on this, when he first entered the lottery, Gordy Ainsley was still in kindergarten. Talk about postmodernism. He'd entered before the race yeah, even existed. that's right. And on Saturday, Andrew will be towing the line. So if you don't know, Western States is... Probably the most storied and oldest 100-mile race, certainly in the US. Well, it's not the oldest race in the world. It's the oldest race, 100-mile race in the US. And if you didn't get the Gordy Ansley gag, he was the first person to take part in what was then the Western States One Day Ride, which was a horse race over the trail. And he did it without a horse, first person. Anyway, we caught – oh, hang on. Is this a fact check going on? No, 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 no. It was no. a fact check I, was it, the, it was the Confederates' Cup, Yeah. I think that was what it was called. Right. And um, yeah, his horse went lame. So he had a horse. Yeah. And he walked but the horse broke down. Yeah, ran out. Yeah. Anyway, we didn't catch up with Gordy Ainsley. We didn't ask him about his kindergarten days, but we did catch up with Andrew McDowell before his departure to chat all about his preparations. <laughs> yep, that's right. I've still got to put the rubbish out. I've still got to hang the washing up. You know, this is the thing, like, uh, a week like this, it's you know, I'm sure you guys know, like a week before you're going away, especially on like a big mission that's going to carry on, you suddenly everything needs to be done, and you keep thinking, I've got so much time, and you you don't. Uh, it's it's like, what are we at um, from today? It's six days to go till I jump on a plane, and the amount that I have to do, whether it's work or kids stuff or um, packing, um, I'm a shocker. Like I'm I'm always packing my bag like an hour before the drive to the airport I'm just so last minute and then I sit in the airport and think of all the things I forgot because I wasn't organized um I have just, you got a spreadsheet yeah. no you see that's when Emma was crewing me she's amazing because she is like a spreadsheet queen she just everything's on a spreadsheet so when we go away camping or whatever she just pulls out the, the specific spreadsheet for that type of trip 
And, and so when I was doing races and she was crewing, she had the spreadsheet for that. But of course, I did not have this. I don't even know how spreadsheet programs work. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> anyway, I just, I've got two questions. One, uh, in terms of your, and this is an important thing, going to Western States and all, Andrew McDowell, are you going to rock like the very on trend uh, and you have the body for it? Are you going to, are you going to crop? Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Uh, I can assure you, I don't have the body for it. <laughs> you do. Are you going to do the the the, the uric crop? I'm a, I, look. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't think I am. Uh, it, it, it's it's not really crossed my mind. I'm, I, you just you, if you're going to do that, now. yeah, well, until now, but I'm dismissing it as quickly because like you got to be pretty fast if you're going to wear that. And, uh, you know, there's, that's not, that's not, and, although I am going to wear my light peach colored, um, uh, Pacer t-shirt from an Auckland marathon a few years ago, because it's like such a bright color. And my theory is that, you know, the lighter, the color, the least hot. It's also really, really thin. We'll see. I don't know. Do you know what also help with cooling? Cropping. <laughs> and putting holes in the <laughs> shirt. <laughs> Just cutting those little wind, yep, wind holes. Yeah, that's it. Speed holes. Can you imagine what my like white pasty skin would look like after that? It would just have all these little red, <laughs> these little red sort of ovals <laughs> after the race. You'd look like one of those um, old jesters with the diamonds. Oh, beautiful, mate! Or or be lying on a giant shark shark D mat. Yeah, is that how you say them? Anyway, in yeah. all seriousness, I mean, look, this has been a hell of a journey for you. You're going to Western States. What's all the fuss about? <laughs> well, I. <laughs> I guess the fusses before and during. The, there's two different types of fusses. Getting in is is the first fuss. Uh, I, I suppose it's the old golden golden ticket, really. Like I think that's what makes the a lot of the race the allure of the race these days is just how hard it is to get in. And so you do feel very lucky. I mean, by the time I get to the start line, it would have been um, nine years and four months from the first qualifying race. So just shy of a decade. Uh, I was 36 years old when I ran my qualifying race, and I'm 46 now, um, which is, uh, yeah, terrifying. So that, you know, in, in 128 tickets, you still feel lucky. I mean, I was in Taipei when they did the draw last year with a bunch of other runners from around the world, and, and, and one of those other American runners, Jeff Urbanski, he um, also had 128 tickets and didn't get it. So... You know, he's, he'll be 256 tickets next year. That's nine years. And uh, he, he gets to pace it this year for his brother, Matt Advansky, who came to New Zealand. So you probably know the fella. Yeah. Winner winner of the 100 mile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I'm, I've actually beaten both of them now, both brothers. I've got lucky. They both had bad days. <laughs> Those I'm not quicker than them. But uh, so Matt's hoping to, uh, to get one back on me, uh, which I'm sure he will uh, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so which makes me feel I still feel fortunate, even though you know the odds were something like seventy percent or something. Um, that's still plenty of opportunity to not get in. You know, years ago, getting into UTMB, uh, the, the system was different, and they let you in on the third year, but on the second year, your odds were like eighty five percent, and I still didn't get in. Uh, there were eight Kiwis, seven got in. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, come on, man. I'm not a, I, there's no point in me buying lotto tickets, man. It just takes me forever. Uh, and the same, of course, with Hard Rock. That's about eight years now. And I mean, that's so much harder to get into, but I will continue to uh, try. So yes, that that's a very long answer to some of the allure of it is just how difficult it is to get in. I've got no idea what the course is like, but by all accounts, it's um, something very special. I really like how the race is only the 100 mile race. There's no... 50k there's no 100k there's no half marathon that it's, it's a very simple pure we're all doing the same event um which I, I really enjoy because essentially you're all in this together you know you're all you, there's not someone racing off the front because they're only running a 10k or something like that you, you can sort of get into your groove but you know and obviously the extremes you start at 2,000 odd meters you, you run up to nearly 3,000 
you're in snow, although not, not much snow this year. It sounds like it's going to be really hot, and uh, which you know for the first few hours will be swifter than previous years. You know, Thomas Watson ran it last year, and I think he said he did about 28 kilometers of snow, and people just slided all over the place, and it's really hard work. That so, I'm thankful to not have that but uh the flip side is that means of course it will be it's looking like mid 40s in the canyons uh auburn which is the finish line is is hovering around 39 degrees at the moment it looks like on race day so i mean you know i've been training in five degrees it, there's not much you can do about it i'm sitting in my studio right now with the heat cranked like it's really hot in here <laughs> You know, this isn't the best I can do. So, uh, you know, and I've got I, I've got sort of six days over there to to sort of get a little bit more heat acclimatization and do some, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, 5K or something like that, just go exploring as an attempt to get used to it. So that's probably the other part of the race that is such an allure is the history and the actual course itself and how interesting it's going to be. But I've not run a step of it, so uh, I will be finding out, you know, for myself so nine years ago you first entered first had a crack yeah but when was the first time you heard about it uh it's definitely good old Dean Khan as is it's definitely his book and oh, that would have been like sort of 2011 2012 you know somewhere around there my brother-in-law actually got me a book called extreme running and it had uh it's actually not far away it's somewhere it's actually in here somewhere and it had like this uh crazy race called the Kepler Challenge in it and uh, I thought god that looks interesting and this was about 2010 about 2010, I'd run like one or two marathons and they'd been awful. But I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to do that. That looks great. Um, so, uh, but it also had uh, UTMB, but it, I didn't have Western States in it. So I didn't hear about it then, but that was that was definitely the sort of start of that that journey. And then I think it was probably, we, we never can't as his book. I, I think I was about four years late reading it, uh, about 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. And of course, I remember this that incredible graph. There's a picture in the book of, the Boston Marathon course versus the Western States course. And uh, the Boston has, they talk about Heartbreak Hill and Boston Marathon. And uh, it's got this little sort of tiny bump on, the, on what looks like a pretty much a flat line on the graph. And then you've got Western States with these enormous ups and downs and all, you know, constantly going down. And I mean, it looks, because of the elevations higher, the, the, plot, the plot chart is much higher. So it looks way more scary, but it's still like, you look at it and you go, wow. That looks impossible. I'm going to, I must try it. I must try it. I must see what it's like. And I think when you first get that first race in, which took an extra year because I, <laughs> bloody Tarawera was the uh, the cyclone year, so that didn't count as a qualifier. And then I DNF'd uh, the Norse face, which is UTA now, the first time I tried it at 91Ks because I was hypothermic and hadn't eaten anything. I was a shambles. And anyway, you learn the hard way sometimes. So I took another year to actually finish a race that was 100k and must have been 2015, um, yeah, 2015. Uh, and here we are in 2024, <laughs> finally getting into the bloody thing. Wow. That is some endurance in itself, in and of itself. So did you ever think of dipping out? Like when you were missing out year after year after mm. year and having to go to all these races to qualify and get a ticket, was there ever a point where you were like, nah, nah, screw it? No, no, the very opposite uh, just made me more determined, I would say. I mean, there was one year where, what happened? Like, I, oh, Tarawera got cancelled, thanks to COVID. And so I suddenly didn't have an entry. And um, the Tolpo 100 had not yet been announced as a qualifier. So I realised just to get the qualifier, I had to look abroad. And um, the, the nearest one that fitted in the time was the Blackhall 100 up in Queensland. So I ended up entering a race and flying over there and, and doing their race uh, initially just to, to have the entry. That was the only reason, really. I I'd, I'd pay you pay all this money and everything, and that's simply to have a chance, which I didn't get, but, you know, it got me another step along the uh, lottery ticket ladder. But, of course, the funny thing is because I wanted to, uh, to get that qualifier, you know, I ended up having an amazing weekend and taking part in a race that was awesome and meeting great people and having a great adventure. And just so happened, one of my biggest clients also works in Brisbane. So I ended up going out on the town with him and having a great night. So you're sort of like, well, I'm glad that was sort of thrust upon me because it ended up being a really, really good thing to do. So yeah, so no, at no point did I ever go bugger this. I just got, probably got more annoyed every single uh, year that that uh, lottery went through and my name wasn't drawn. I was like, come on. But I mean, when you when you have a running problem like me, like an addiction like me, it's not hard to sort of stay on the course. I, I will be interested to see, like, 
because you know I've still got Hard Rock I want to do. I've still got Tour de Jeans, and I do wonder if I tick off. You know, that will be my four big ones. I wonder what that motivation will be mm. like. You know, I wonder how I'll feel after that. I might be a little lost. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I'll let you know. We can, <laughs> we can sit around a table and muse about the good old days. Then it's going to take so long to get in the hard rock. You have climbed the peak. How are you going to deal with the elevation, man? You see, you're starting at two thousand meters, moving up three thousand. I mean, you're what's what's Maunga Kiki top out at? <laughs> One hundred and ninety-six <laughs> meters for uh, not Maunga and, Kiki, Ma- Maunga Fo. Maunga Fo, sorry. Maunga Kiki is One Tree Hill. One Tree Hill. That's well. What does Maunga Kiki top out? One hundred and ninety. It's like it's like three meters lower or four meters. Lower. Oh, I suppose if you could go up the Oblix, you'd be ahead. But yeah, no, that's obviously not not particularly helpful. But the only other comparison i've run at elevation twice uh utb goes up to about 2600 i didn't notice anything i, I was i was running fine there was no no problem at all um and many years ago i got to run at aspen and went up from aspen so i think i got to about thirteen and a half thousand feet there um just on a morning run after a big night and in the snow and everything and that felt okay too so i don't think at that elevation it's going to be an, an issue uh, and you're not there for long you would kind of just go up and over so i'm not i'm not too worried he says you know, hopefully. And then, of course, after that, it's all just... it's What I, what I am worried about, apart from, um, you know, obviously Eugene, mountain lions and, and bears. Um, Hang on. Is, you're worried about Eugene, mountain lions and bears? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, he's just going to come out of the bushes in yeah. some place. Yeah. Ah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, is, is, I mean, the heat's the big one. And, obviously, uh, downhills are something that has never really been a problem in the past. But because of my recent uh, DNF at Northburn, I'm a little concerned about what it's going to be like. I mean, my, my quads after 110K at Northburn, I, they couldn't hold me up. And there is a lot of downhill at Western States. So I'm, I'm just got to be more careful. And I've done what I can between then and now. I've been smashing every downhill I can find. I've done tons of vert. I've had really good big training weeks leading up to this. I've probably the best block before a race ever, although I've said that before and not had great races. So I'm not necessarily resting on my laurels on that one. So, yeah, but it's not great to come from essentially two bad milers this year with Tarawera not going particularly well either, just some P issues. Um, and... Uh, um, and then Northburn quads just completely gone um, and not even being able to finish. Um, you know, I tried going out on that last loop. I couldn't get down the hill before I was falling over. So I had to just, I sort of like, I could probably crawl 50K, but um, I don't think I need to do that. Uh, well, let's not let's not dwell on that. Let's dwell yeah. on the positives. Your well, build-up has gone well. Yes. You've got us behind you. What could go wrong? Yeah. Maybe him in front of you. You never know where he is on True. the trail. I'll just pop out. Eugene on, Eugene on the mountain lines. Yeah, uh, you're right. And I think I do have to tell myself that. Obviously, I'm cacking myself. Like the, the the big problem about having a race that takes 10 years to get into is you know that, well, it's probably going to take you 10 years to get into it again. So don't fuck it up. Sorry, don't mess it up. And and that's been a huge part of like, in my, it's just been yelling at me, screaming in my head for the last few months is like, mate, this is not something you can come back next year and have another go at. You, you've got to get this right. And I wish it would be a bit quieter but it's pretty loud. And, you know, some, some would say that's good because it means I'm going to go out very carefully. On my watch, I'm not going to have any any metrics apart from heart rate. I'm just going, I'm not going to have the time. I'm not going to have the speed, the distance. I'm not going to even look at that until I'm at least 100 km, maybe 120. I mean, I'll know by certain aid stations where I'm at, but um, I'm not going to be caring about any of that because the moment I start thinking about a finishing time, or uh, getting to certain aid stations at a certain time or trying to catch that person. At the moment, my head goes in that direction. Uh, it's dangerous. The, the the goal is not to place well. The goal is to have a great day. Yes, I'd love to finish under 24 hours. Obviously, a silver buckle is, is the main dream, you know. And so long as I have a even an okay day, that should be very achievable. You know, I think about Tarawera and I probably spent five hours either sleeping, sitting on the side of the ring, talking to medics. I was off course for so long and I still did 25 and a half hours. So I sort of think, well, okay, that's, should be able to get there. Um, so the, but no matter how much I sort of tell myself, hey man, you're fit, you're good, this is going to be great, you've got no injuries, and uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be a great day, no matter how much I tell myself that, this, I'm still just absolutely cacking myself. I guess even, and this is the thing, bar. Barring something going 
you know, touch wood, horribly wrong, a, a bad day at Western States is still a 10-year day. It's still a pinnacle. Right, so that's something. I mean, yeah. It, so long as I finish, I don't exactly. really that's, care yeah. how I got there. I would like to not get there with t- hours of suffering, but if if that's what it takes to get in under thirty hours and just get the thing done, then so be it. You know, I, I will I will take that. But yeah, hopefully it's not like that. It shouldn't be. It's just the heat. I've never run in forty five degree heat. I've got no idea what it's going to be like. You know, it just sounds horrific. I'm looking at the videos of Dan Jones running through the canyons and going, it looks, it looks horrific. It looks so hot. Um, and, and like, I'm, yeah, I just can't imagine it. So, Well, you and your peach crop top mm-hmm. cut out with big cutouts with an ice buff. Yes. Maybe like a ice buff helmet. Handheld in both hands. Handheld. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, short shorts. Yeah, quite high, like high cut, two inch cut. Yeah, you, we, we believe, we believe you're going to have an awesome day. Know that, you know, so many people down here will be cheering for you and um, just enjoy it. Have a cracker day, mate. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Eh? And we are looking forward to catching up with Andrew when he gets back. Cut a few at Eho. Just go for it. Full send. Well, don't full send. Control yourself like you talked about and mostly enjoy it and yeah can't wait to watch that tracker i mean we both know he's such a good runner yeah and he's super competitive i'm sure he will be fighting the red mist yes the red mist probably he'll be standing there at olympic valley and the red mist will be coming up so true true how excited would you be you know you've been looking forward to it for nine years and Mm. there you are right let's get on with the rest of the show matt have you got a question I do have a question. It got me thinking, you know, big re- big race preparation. And what I wanted to ask is what is the most underrated aspect of big race preparation? And what is the, in your opinion, what is the most overrated aspect of big race preparation? Mm, mm. I had to think back to big race preparations <laughs> that I've done. Uh, what, yeah, and in, in terms of overrated, you mean... What they're they're hyped up, and something that people bang on about, or maybe it's it, it's you know it's the coming thing, or it's as a newbie into the thing, or if you've not that you people get really tied up in. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, the overrated thing, and I've been guilty of this myself, is massive, massive long runs. So if you, you know, if you have um, the idea that you're running 100 miles, you know, you've got to run 100 miles, forget it. Don't get anywhere anywhere near that. I ran an 80K in preparation for a 100 mile race about six weeks out, was it, I think? Maybe, yeah, I think about six weeks out. And although it was good for me in terms of confidence, looking back, I think it just stripped me of too much, too close to the race. I wouldn't do, and in fact, for my next 100 mile build up, I didn't do 80K. I didn't, certainly didn't do 80k. So I think those massive long runs are something that you, you know, you feel you have to do. And I know talking to lots of runners preparing for these races over the year, they sort of like, oh, I haven't done anywhere near that distance. I need to, you know, stretch up to that distance. No, you don't. No, you don't. I mean, I guess ultimately get some good advice. Don't listen to some clown on a podcast like me, but, you know, maybe self a coach and, and have a read around and so on. But to me, I think that those huge days are detrimental if you're building up to a big race, unless you are used to that kind of distance. And that's that's the whole thing. It's you know you're preparing your body for a big test. You don't want to burn those matches before the big day. So that to me would be the biggest, the most overrated, underrated, and it's kind of related to that really is. Keeping healthy and injury free. I've seen lots of runners sort of bash on and bash on, even though they're carrying injuries. They're you know they've got niggles. They're 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 sick because they're run down because their bodies are depleted. And I just think you know the value of actually being healthy and injury free is underestimated hugely. Mm. And I think. That should be one thing that you keep top of mind as you prepare for a big race is, you know, sure, you need to train. Sure, you need to test yourself. And sure, training is all about, you know, breaking down the body and then it recovering and 
being, you know, coming back stronger. But that's the point. It needs to recover. So if you're in a position where you're just smashing your body and it's not, you're not well, you're sick, you know, you've got, in, you got injuries, you you know, even niggles that are just going on and on and on, get them sorted. You're not, you know, it's not, it's not a toughness thing. It's not a, it's going to be detrimental to you in the long term. So that would be my over and under. Do you know Keith Crook? Yes. Legend, yeah. right? I remember catching up with him and he was talking about, and he was in sort of that first tranche of, he ran Tarawera probably before you did. He was in that sort of Mal Law. And he talked about the fact that they all got to the start line of Tarawera and it was Tarawera 100K then. And they were all utterly broken because they'd done exactly what, you know, <laughs> what you'd said they'd done, the huge miles or they'd taken a, what does Kerry say? You know, you'd see people who like take a marathon plan and double it, which is just not going to work, right? And they got to the, yeah, and, and they said, A, they didn't enjoy the day or they did enjoy the day, obviously, and you finished, but probably didn't have the best run and probably didn't, yeah, get it get it done. And those, those niggles are so important, isn't it? It's the, and the difference between we know ourselves when a, when an adaption, like I know when I start sort of building up, I'm going to get some tendon issues and generally my post tendon in my foot. And I know the difference between this is an adaption issue, which will resolve with care or if this goes south. And it's, I think it's having that wisdom to know which is which, hey? Yeah, and that is a tricky thing, especially when you are new, new isn't it? Is knowing what's just, I've got sore legs versus I have an injury or I have <laughs> yeah. the beginnings of an injury. My legs hurt. You know, and I, I can't talk. I, you know, I, I say, especially inexperienced runners, but, you know, it's back in January, I had a issue and I thought, oh, I'll just run through this, you know. <laughs> I mean... I'm not saying that's what has done me in, but, it, you know, you can be dumb, can't you? But you've just got to be honest with yourself, really. But I guess it's that double-edged sword, though, isn't it, too? Because you don't want to have a glass jaw for this stuff, right? And there's that thing of, and, and we don't talk about it, like running sucks and it hurts. And even when it's feeling, when you're feeling great, it still sucks. And it can still really hurt when you're having a really good time. So I, my over and under... So my over, and I learned this the hard way, was overly prescriptive nutrition. So now the caveat with that is unless you have like a ground nut allergy and have to carry an EpiPen or have like celiacs or anything like that, I'm not suggesting, or, you know, someone who's been a lifelong vegetarian, plant-based vegan, whatever, but even within that space, having an overly prescriptive nutrition strategy going into a race i think we've both learned and, and and lots of people learn that you know you have to try things out prior to race day try try things that don't work i always think about remember in scott Durek's first book where he he was like running around and he had a flask of olive oil yes <laughs> and he just shat himself yeah. <laughs> but oh. you think hey you think well uh, this might work or you know and you go through periods but going into a race where you have an overly prescriptive, precise, you know, and again, you know, I'm talking about sort of the everyday runner, uh, you have an overly prescriptive nutrition strategy and then something happens and, and your nutrition goes south. You haven't tried it or you rely on one thing and then you've got to sort of, so for me, it's training my body to run on what a uh, Toyota Corolla would instead of a Ferrari. Yeah, absolutely. Seems Seems to be the seems to be the thing that's helped, you know? So like I know the things that I like to eat and I like a mix of kind of, I like real food. I like if the real food, it's going to be savory. So I don't like sweet, sweet things, but I also like gels and I don't mind towel either or liquid calories, you know? So it's a mix of those stuff. But I know that if it goes south, I can get by on watermelon, nuts, you know, that sort of thing. I think that's a real... I've seen so many people who've had a bad day because they've they it's worked until it hasn't, you know, and then yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, you know, it's it's that thing too, like having run around, you know, the last time I did Kepler with gastro, that feeling of everything that I've eaten sitting in your stomach not digesting is just so horrible. And then uh, Joe Kane offering me uh, egg and bacon pie. <laughs> At Rainbow Reach, nearly did me in. Just the, the smell of it. 
Oh, my God. <sighs> and then accusing you of being green. Yeah, those at the same time. I was a green because. <laughs> because of what she was offering uh, you. <laughs> and I was the, I mean, I was the color of that hat. That's actually, mm. we asked for Matt, Matt Rainbow Reach green there. <laughs> Underrated, a good taper. I guess that ties into what you're saying, but a good taper, eh? And when you, that's a sweet spot too, right? Like there's a real science to that. I, I've tapered very poorly and I've had one or two occasions where I've tapered very well. <sighs> Feels like dog's balls while you're doing it, right? You start to go, or I start to go absolutely mad. Every negative thought and cognition that has been turned down by the sensory modulation of running is on 11. Uh, every phantom injury and ailment springs back up. You're generally a bit of a dick to be around of at work and at home and it's hard but getting to race day rested and just itching to just get after it is one of the best feelings yeah one of yeah i remember one race in particular where i tapered and the first step of the race i was like yeah it was the first step i was like this has all been worth it like and that was a pretty good day. That's such a good feeling, isn't it? I'm just trying to think whether I've actually felt it <laughs> in a big race. I don't know that I have. I always, I mean, I always let my nerves overwhelm me on race day, or I'm trying to contain myself, and so I don't let myself feel that excitement. Perhaps, yeah. But it's it's, it's so important. If you if your body feels good at the start, it makes such a difference. You know, at at Naseby, uh, hundred mile last year, I knew on the start line that it wasn't it wasn't going to go well i was having to punch my hip <laughs> to try and convince convince the, the strain to go away and that was as a result of a, an injury the week before which you know so that's probably the worst type of week ever <laughs> but yeah standing on the start line knowing that you are prepared is invaluable isn't it I mean, I, any Southlander who saw an Aucklander just running along punching himself in the groin area would have just been like, oh, yeah, okay, oh, yeah. That's, what, yeah. that's what they do. <laughs> oh, yeah, one rule for them, eh? One rule for us. But just what about be, the time you to ran? Clarify, to clarify, it wasn't in the groin area, but anyway. The hip <laughs> is in the groin area. Well, it was at the side of the hip. <laughs> any, it could have been looking at you from behind. Sure, anyway, true. All right. What, what are we going to well, You ran four sub three hour marathons yes. in a 12 month period yep. which is pretty epic what about those start lines i well the rotorua first one i did i it was a training run so i i was actually i had no expectations i hadn't even properly tapered for it because it wasn't supposed to be a race race it was a very much a b right. race and i you know i didn't even run with a watch i just I just ran and, but I wasn't sort of tapered for it. Right. So I had very low expectations, you know, just, I'm just going out for a training run. Well, you know, I had zero expectations, but which I Pretty mean, good I wasn't expecting run. anything. Yeah. 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 And it worked out really well. So then, but then perversely, cause I was, what I was aiming to do was to run sub three at Christchurch. And then when I ran sub three at Rotorua and by 10 minutes, it kind of actually threw me quite a lot because I thought, oh no, what do I do now? You know, I've kind of, ugh. I had to readjust things for Christchurch. So I was actually quite nervous on the start line at Christchurch because I knew I should be able to run faster than what I had at Rotorua, but I I was kind of like, ah, oh, trying to get the maths right. Flat of course too, eh? Yeah, that's right. So it should be, it should be. It. So there was all that kind of expectation, I guess, on myself of expecting to go faster, therefore more pressure. So I didn't really feel... I felt, I mean, I, I did feel, physically I felt really good, but I didn't have that kind of good start line vibe uh, like you talked about. Yeah, so it is strange, isn't it? It is, you know, getting your taper right is really important and it's so, yeah, like you said, underrated, underrated. Because it is tempting to do, you know, you feel like, oh, I haven't done enough, I should yeah. do a longer run than yeah. what, you know, what I should be. And you go yeah. out and like the only thing you're going to do is trash yourself in the last yeah. week. You can't, you can't train your way to a better race in the last week. No, you can't. You can't. I, yeah. I remember being on a track. So at the trusts and it was night doing 400s and I'm not a track guy, obviously, but I remember going, God, I feel good. You know, like 
and just sharpening up just yeah. those little it was six by 400 you know yeah. bing bang boom you're done yeah. you're out of there within 45 minutes with warm up and warm down but just that that kind of that sweet spot bonus question yes what's the best finish line vibe you've ever had uh what year was it was it 2015 tarawera at uh finishing in kawaro kawaro at Furman Field in the 100k and I just had a race where things had just gone right for me and I can't remember the time I don't know what I ran but I just I, I was really happy with it I'd gone really well I finished in daylight my family was there kids ran at the finish line with me oh, I just loved it it was it was superb I, I really really enjoyed it I'd had a great day I trained well for it and I got kind of, you know, I didn't run faster than I thought I had. I, you know, it, it was just like a perfect race. It wasn't, wasn't like a outstanding performance or anything. I didn't place or anything, but it just, no, well, nowhere near it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm not saying it was a performance, but I'm saying it was a, it was a run that I was just so happy with and it just made me joyful. And I've still, you know, I still got that photo of us all at the finish line. And I just love it. It's kind of, yeah, it just makes me happy when I think of it. What about you? I reckon that year at Tarawera was pretty good. I think I came in about an hour after you. So just hugging daylight, which was pretty cool. And had our kids and the Chapman's kids run in. And, and I heard uh, the famous thing, the, the announcer said, this kid, this guy's got more kids than Farlap, which <gasps> I've stolen. Now st- yeah, that's your signature yeah, line. It's my wow. signature line. And I took yeah. that <laughs> because... Um, I remember. That's a great line. But I felt so ratchet when I finished that it just soon disintegrated. Probably the Tanifa when I finished third equal with Leah Ansis mm-hmm. yeah. and and crossed the line together. That was that was rad. That was that was really because that was again that was a moment of performance and finishing on your own terms. Like, but like that was because we negotiated sort of a kilometer out. Do we fight this out or do we, <laughs> you know, like run in together? And, and we decided to run in together. And, you know, everyone was there and had worked hard for that race. And that was really cool. Super cool. So probably that one. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I just remember, I remember when you were talking about Scott Jurek and his olive oil <laughs> when I was at school. I don't know, like fifth form, so what's that these days? I don't know. Uh, year, year 12? 11. 11. And I had a mate who was very clever, actually, but he decided that he was going to try and experiment a little bit with nutrition stuff. And he had obviously read somewhere about salts. And so he made up this lick, this basically water and salt, like table salt mixture. And we went and did mile loops, mile repeats up at the domain and in between, which was drinking this salt water. How'd that go for him? Yeah, well, both of us just. How'd that go up, for you guys? Yeah, projectile vomiting. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. If anyone was in the domain that day, I'm really sorry. The body was, is wise, eh? The body is wise. <laughs> we were not. We were not. The body so is hang, boys hang. are not. Uh, yeah, so sometimes experiments can go wrong. But you're absolutely right on that nutrition front. Variety is the key, isn't it? Because, you know, we've both had races where we've prepared and thought that that's what our nutrition was going to be on the day. And then on the day, your body just goes, no, 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 no you're not no. having that. No. no. Yeah. Anyway, are you, where are you? Where's your, I mean, it's very early days, but where's your head thinking nutrition wise ahead of Tarawira Milo next year? My head, now, this is, again, this is, own like so this is not a paid endorsement for any um so obviously spring energy awesome sauce but um (laughs) heaps of calories just a two well if you fill a two liter camelback with enough of it you'll be fine i'm really enjoying and this is my own again this is not an affiliate thing uh talk gels Right. I really like those. Yeah. I think they're great. However, anyone from Talk Gels is listening and they want that. So. Yeah, exactly. Talk <laughs> Gels, they get you through. Um, the Cherry Bakewell one tastes like Benadryl. And I really, right. really like Benadryl. Cough medicine. Um, mm, oh. Yeah, I'm a big cough medicine head. Have you but, ever um, just carried cough medicine? I like mean, a flask of cough? The premier- <laughs> <laughs> well, I could make lean, which is like promethazine, cough medicine, 7-Up, and a uh, like a sparkler. Spark, that that would be good. I never carry cough medicine, but I really like talk gels. So a combination of something like talk gels, bit of tailwind, 
um, and wraps and Pringles are a standard for me and then probably something else. So that's how I'm already going into it. So, um, yeah, just just already keeping it keeping an open mind and being also really uh, really mindful not to make myself sick of talk gels. But I do like them. They're, they're cool. Like they're, they're just – I like how they're kind of English. They're very English. So they're kind of, for me, like custard – apple custard. I'm like, right. I like apple custard. <laughs> you know, like cherry bakewell. <laughs> I like cherry bakewell. It's, it's something that I – yeah, so – yeah, what's the, what's that? What's that gel there, Matt? It's a Yorkshire pud. <laughs> yeah, I would go for a full English I, Sunday yeah. roast gel. Oh. So if anyone's up there, yeah, saying a, a full English Sunday roast gel, mm, mm. I just I'd settle for the Yorkshire pud actually. Yeah, delicious. Mm. Even just as it is, there you go. Right, <laughs> this food podcast has probably run its course. Sponsored by Benadryl. Benadryl, <laughs> you won't remember the afternoon. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't remember the afternoon. Uh, that's it. Another aid station done. Thank you to our aid station crew for all the support. And we love doing this and we love having you along for the ride. Uh, stay tuned for the quote unquote regular DCR podcast next week when we have an amazing guest lined up for an incredible chat. Hey, Cornet. Hey, Cornet. Thanks, Rigby. <laughs>